What is the kingdom of heaven like? What is life to the full? A road laid out before us, it's winding, but we trust in the journey that's open to all. So come to the Father, come one and all. You are invited to take up the call. His mercy can cover what's gone before. So come as you are. Come one and all. Hello and welcome back to week two of Invited. It's an absolute delight, a real pleasure to be back here with you again. And I hope you've noticed we've got a bit of a theme song. I just thought I'd mention that. Um, it's called Come One and All and it was especially written for us uh, for the Invited Mission by the wonderful Catholic worship band called One Hope Project. So thank you so much to Joe and to the gang uh, for putting that together for us. I know we'll all be singing it for months and months to come because it's just so wonderful and it just, just gets stuck in your head and brings you such joy every time you hum it to yourself. If you've only just joined us for the first time, I would um, encourage you to pause this video, go back and find episode one and start there. Uh, there is an order and hey, who doesn't love a bit of catch up TV? So do, do, uh, do start with episode one if you haven't watched it yet. What did we talk about in episode one? Well, we talked about God's amazing love for us. And I posed some journal questions at the end of the episode. I do hope you've had the chance to spend some time reflecting on those questions. Um, and also, I hope you've really had the chance to unpack those reflections with other people in the community. You may have taken part in the diocesan conversation that a huge massive event taking place on Zoom. You might have had um, a more intimate conversation at parish level with your local prayer group or um, you know a small discussion group that has been brought together in your in your local parish for this purpose. Um, you might have had a one-to-one -one telephone call with a friend where you've just had a little bit of a chat about the episode and just touched on the questions briefly. However you've done it, Talking really affirms our faith. Um, it allows us to look at things in a new way and other people can shed light on our thoughts, our feelings and our beliefs. As I said, we talked about God's love for us um, and for some people, they may have realised that God loves them so much more than they had ever dared to hope or could possibly ev even imagine. But it is true. You are a beloved child of God. God created you for a relationship of love with him. But like all relationships, we know that they can all too easily fall apart. David very clearly stated in his talk last week that we don't always do the good that we desire to do. And we don't always avoid the bad that we desire to avoid. Hello, my name is Pia and I want to take you on a deeper dive into the theology of human brokenness. The picture behind me is an altarpiece from St John's, the former seminary at Wanush. I think it is beautiful and so perhaps an odd place to start thinking about brokenness. I want to begin here because in the Christian tradition, yes, we talk about brokenness, but brokenness is always spoken of in the same breath as hope. Why? Because human brokenness can never stop God from loving us, loving each one of us so much that he gave his only son to heal us, restore and redeem us and conquer all brokenness. So starting with Jesus in the incarnation, the picture here, uh, the angel Gabriel and Mary when Mary says yes to becoming the mother of God, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, he breaks into our world in a real physical way and he takes his place among us in a broken world. Then Jesus's birth, the middle picture, Christmas. In the chaos and confusion of the forced movement of people, of migrants, of political oppression, 
a young woman gives birth far from her home. Her husband, Joseph, fails to find somewhere suitable for his wife. But it turns out to be truly fitting for the Son of God to be born on straw. If God can be born in straw, he can be born in hearts that are broken. Often Christmas, the time for families, is a time of acute difficulty for people living in broken relationships. But every Christmas is a still and holy time, a rare moment of peace, of harmony, when the angels sing and the lion lies down with the lamb. The coming of Jesus, true God and true man, is our hope in a broken world. In the Christian tradition, Jesus, the Redeemer, is called the second Adam, Mary, the second Eve. And this points backwards to Genesis and the source of our brokenness. The stories of creation and the fall in Genesis are symbolic stories. They explain deep truths. They are the word of God in human language. The first thing to note is that when God creates human beings, they are created good in God's image. However broken we are, we are good and we are loved. You may have realised that there are two accounts of the creation of human beings. Genesis 1 verse 27, human beings made in God's image. And Genesis 2, Adam made of the earth and Eve flesh of his flesh. These different accounts were written at different times by different authors, but the final editor kept both accounts together because they each contribute to the richness and wonder of what it is to be human. As custodians of creation, Adam and Eve have a relationship of care for the world around them. As the early church fathers pointed out, it is fitting that human beings care for the environment because human beings are both material and spiritual beings. You know, we belong in the world and we belong in heaven. We're a unity of body and soul. And then sharing a common human nature, Adam and Eve have a special relationship with each other. Bone from my bone, flesh from my flesh, where each is at the same time unique and unrepeatable, yet called to form what Pope St John Paul II calls a communion of persons. Most significantly, made in the image and likeness of God, both, human, both Adam and Eve are in a particular relationship with God. In all these relationships, we're called to love, and human beings are free to accept or reject this call to love. Now, we all know the story of the fall. God allows Adam and Eve to eat from all of the trees in the garden, but God forbids them from eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, this prohibition feels like a limitation, especially since human beings always want to have more, to know more, and surely knowing good and evil is a good thing. But in the story, the tree of knowledge is a symbol of the origin of ethical and religious values. By stealing, and this is what it is, by stealing from the tree, Adam and Eve wanted to be like God. They stopped trusting in God, they became ruled by pride. In effect, rather than accepting that God is the source of knowledge of good and evil, and God communicates this knowledge to his children, human beings want to be the ones to decide what is good and evil. We want to live by our own self-determination. We want to make up the rules. We want to forget that we are dependent on God. Wanting to make up our own rules about things with no reference to wisdom, no reference to the givens of this world, above all, no reference to God. Sounds familiar? It's the pride of human beings. And the result? A change, brokenness in every relationship. Hardship, pain and toil, thorns and thistles in relation to the world. We tend to exploit the natural world and pollute our environment, forgetting that the world is our home. Shame lust, and the search for power over each other, sin always crouching at the door, forgetting that the other person is another person like me and not an object for me. Even in our own selves, we are, as St Augustine puts it, like a house divided. As St Paul says, we cannot seem to do the good we know we should do. And our relationship with God? The first sin, 
original sin is not like a personal fault in us, nor does original sin totally corrupt human nature. We are still good, but it does mean that human nature is wounded, subject to ignorance, suffering, death, and inclined to sin. We tend to choose all the things that distract us from God and the good. Now, the first sin may have broken our relationship with God by depriving human beings of original holiness, but however frail, foolish, ungrateful human beings are, God does not abandon us. Throughout the Old Testament, God is faithful to his people. He loves his people with a steadfast love, and he goes in search of them to turn them back to him. Let's return to our picture. By her yes to God's will, Mary, the second Eve, reversed the disobedience of the first Eve. In the Magnificat, Mary's song of praise in St Luke's Gospel, Mary proclaims the greatness of God who has done great things for her. She recognises her dependence on God, the Almighty who raises the lowly. Now, in, in 1854, Pope Pius the ninth proclaimed what was part of church tradition the doctrine of the immaculate conception that from the moment of her conception mary was preserved from original sin by a special grace from god and through the merit of her son she is full of grace truly blessed and at the end of her earthly life this is the picture on the far left at the end of her earth life she was taken body and soul into heaven as an anticipation of our own resurrection so, the Incarnation. What's going on? Jesus is not simply God's plan B because human beings messed up his plan A. Jesus is making all things new. In the Exultet at the Easter Vigil, these words are sung. O oh, happy fault, O oh, necessary sin of Adam, which gained for us so great a redeemer. Human beings may have been created good in the image of God with full human dignity, but through Jesus' life, passion, death and resurrection, we're not simply restored to Eden. We are forgiven, restored, redeemed and raised to an even greater dignity. We are called sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, friends of God. Jesus has won the battle. He has conquered death. And that is why we cannot talk about human brokenness without talking about hope. In the Gospels, we hear about Jesus acting in our broken world. We hear about the cosmic Christ who has the power to break the force of storms, who restores calm. Even the wind and waves obey him. Jesus breaks the power of evil over Peter. Even devils fear him. And in the healing miracles, Jesus heals people's personal brokenness. He forgives the sins of the paralytic man before restoring him to health and to his friends. Finally, in the Eucharist and on the cross, Jesus's body is broken for us. We cannot imagine the humiliation and scandal of the cross because the cross is too familiar a sign for us. But for Jesus to die in this way for us and for his disciples to proclaim the victory of the cross means that every person, however marginalized or unworthy or broken, is worthy of love and respect. At Jesus's death, the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two. What separated broken human beings from the presence of the holy God has been torn down. The earth shook and rocks were split. Even the very fabric of the world is affected. Tombs break open. The power of Jesus reaches into the grave. And we know that Jesus instituted the sacrament of baptism to unite us with him with him as the second Adam. In the sacrament of baptism, we truly die and rise to new life with Christ. This new life erases original sin and turns us back to God. However, as the early church fathers pointed out, sometimes it is hard to remember that Jesus has broken the power of sin and death because we still seem to live in a broken world. Our new life can still be weakened and even lost by sin. Just look around at sickness, death, plague and famine, war and violence, human inhumanity to other human beings, never mind my own personal failings. However, a light still shines through brokenness. Jesus the King has indeed fought and won the battle, 
but through the brokenness of the world, we have the privilege of sharing in God's work. We too can work to build up the kingdom of God, a kingdom of justice and love. And for example, Catholic social teaching gives us principles to help us in this work. With God's help, we can work for the healing of each other and of our home, the world, our environment. As for our own brokenness, Jesus also instituted the sacrament of penance as a path to new life, the sacrament of forgiveness, what the fathers of the church called the second plank of salvation after the shipwreck of a loss of grace. We know that Jesus, the good shepherd, always goes in search of the lost sheep. But there is a problem in saying that we're all broken in some way. We're only human after all, so don't blame us, blame weak human nature. It's just the way we are. Like the sheep, I go astray, Jesus finds me. I go astray, Jesus finds me, I go astray. And so it goes on. It is, of course, true that Jesus will always pick us up when we fall. But we also have to take brokenness seriously. God wants broken hearts, not torn garments, because hard hearts are not open. God can work with soft hearts to set things right in us. Moreover, I think that taking the sting out of brokenness by saying that we're all broken seems to trivialise how some people really feel well and truly broken. Now, there are lots of testimonies from people who have really felt grace working through their brokenness. People who feel healed and put back into right relationships with their, themselves, with others and with God. Praise God. But not everyone feels this. This perhaps is especially the case for people who feel they do not have a place in the church community. Perhaps they have separated themselves from the church or they feel marginalised, sidelined or estranged from the church particularly from the Eucharist, and it is difficult to find a way back. Again, let's return to Jesus. And in the middle of the picture near the bottom, we have the cross. The Psalms remind us that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. Jesus, the good Samaritan who can bind up all our wounds, Jesus broken on the cross, still carries his wounds. He is what people call the wounded healer. And Jesus' broken body, laid in the tomb, lies there with those who feel their whole lives are also spent in the cold stone tomb. But they're not forgotten. In the sequence at Pentecost, we pray, melt the frozen, warm the chill. The anonymous 14th century hymn, Soul of My Saviour, has a, a lovely line, I think. and It goes like this, deep in thy wounds, Lord, hide and shelter me. The wounds of Christ and the sacred heart of Christ are deep enough to take all of our brokenness. We can pour into Christ's wounds all of our own sufferings and griefs, pain, pangs and deepest sadness and more. The fourth century scriptural theologian St Jerome had a reputation for being cantankerous and difficult. A story is told that when St Jerome met the child Jesus, Jerome said that he had given everything he had, his work, his possessions, his life to God. But the child Jesus said that he still wanted more. In exasperation, Jerome said that all he had left was his misery. And Jesus replied, that is what I want from you, your misery. The wounds and heart of Jesus can take our pain, our misery, our envy, bitterness, disappointment and resentment, our despair, our stresses and our exhaustion. Jesus, true man, understands the human heart. Jesus, true God, can not only mend what is broken, but he transforms everything we offer him. This hope that God can take and redeem all of our brokenness is not vague optimism or wishful thinking. It is a real and certain hope. As St Paul says, nothing can ever come between us and the love of God made visible in Christ Jesus our Lord. So how would you like to be addressed? Deacon Simon? Just Simon? Simon. 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 That's right, yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us Simon and for um, offering to share a little bit of your personal story with us today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your, your early years, your younger years? Were you born and raised as a Catholic? 
No, not at all. Um, I, I, I was born in South London. Um, quite an ordinary upbringing, I guess. Uh, but faith never made any uh, any impact into uh, my life at all. Um, normal little upbringing, holidays and mum and dad and those sorts of things. But it, it, it was never, ever mentioned. Um, uh, we were all, one conversation I remember having with my dad was that uh, you know, you'll find your own way in life and you'll, you'll, you'll find what you're looking for. Don't worry. Um, and that was as that was as intense as it got, um, really. So, uh, yeah, I think you call that a broad brief, can't you? Yeah, fairly. <laughs> and um, so as a young adult, then, what sort of person did you become? So I, I guess having leave, left school, I, I, I became a typical secular um, individual. I, I was very ambitious with my job. Um, I was very driven that uh, I had to have a house, I had to have a car, I had to have, I had to have, I had to have. And I guess just reflecting back on the words that Father Thomas shared with us earlier, um, I, I, I really was focused on my will and not God's will. And I can see that very much now. But at the time when I was living what I thought was a good life, um, I, I didn't have that context at all to live by. It was a very selfish life. Um, so when we were talking before, you said you sort of living by this sort of capitalist dream. Were you aware that there was something sort of missing in your life at this time? Huge, absolutely huge. One of the things, when you look back, and hindsight is such a wonderful thing, there was this enormous hole in my life. I really didn't know what was missing, but there was just this lack of something. Um, and I tried again and again and I worked harder and I bought more stuff and I, I did more hours and I looked for more promotions and I just drove and drove and drove myself trying to find this hole. What was it? How can I fill it? And, and looking back, so much of my life really was, was lonely, um, was sad um, and was empty. Um, and, and that's what I guess drove me trying to find what it is that's missing in my life but I couldn't find it I couldn't find it um, I tried all sorts of things um, through my through my career I, I was in, uh, invited to join the Freemasons which is uh, quite a thing to share on 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 this uh, journey um, again that was that was looking to find what this hole was um, I, I started to study Kabbalah thinking that perhaps that might for, uh, fill this hole in my life. Um, and I started reading the conspiracy books that were very popular back in the, the 90s and um, things like the Dan Brown books um, and, and uh, the God Delusions and, and those sorts of books. Um, and I must have remember I, I was reading Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion, and, and it got to chapter two. And chapter two, Richard Dawkins' argument was that Man is so clever that if there was a teapot floating around the rings of Saturn, we would see it. And therefore, because we could see a teapot flying around the rings of Saturn, if God really existed, we would find him and we would see him. And, and I remember this almighty sense of how arrogant and how crazy is that? <laughs> um, and I, I guess for me, that, that encounter with um, Richard Dawkins' book was one of the key steps towards me joining and finding my faith with the Lord. Okay, so tell us a little bit about that then. How how did that come about? Well, it, it was it was a wonderful accident, really. My wife and I we were out walking one Sunday morning. There's um, no such thing as accidents when it comes to. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go there, but you know, <laughs> keep me to it. <laughs> and uh, we we were walking around in in Rye. And uh, we just happened to walk past the, the Catholic Church and the choir uh, was singing and, and it really was beautiful. Um, and, and we walked in to, to see what was going on and to see where that wonderful sound was coming from. And uh, we sat at the back of the church for the rest of Mass. Um, and as the parish priest was walking out, uh, he said, oh, hello, you're new. How are you? Um, are you visiting? And, and the conversation started there. And um, I just felt myself being drawn into that conversation, almost being given permission to have that conversation and sharing with um, Father Philip that 
I was looking, I was lost, I was confused, I needed something, I needed help. Um, and, and the rest almost becomes history. I, uh, I, I carried on talking with him, I went back and saw him a couple of times. Um, and then he suggested it might be a good idea to start exploring the essence of faith with the RCIA programme. Um, so I went along to the RCIA programme, um, went along every Saturday, uh, Saturday morning, and uh, met with a lovely lady called Anne, um, and the parish priest. And it was a very gentle, very, uh, very lovely exploration of scripture and myself. And each time we had this conversation, there was that little bit less of a hole. And it just there was a little bit more and a little bit more filled up and a little bit more. Um, and, and it just became the most all consuming hunger to find out more, um, to understand who touch and to embrace and to relish the radiance of god's beauty but it's knowing that it's there that's the challenge that's yeah. the challenge we go through life thinking that we know the answers we have all the answers and if we live that wonderful secular capitalist commercial life that we're going to be happy and my first 35 years really did prove to me that's not the case. So what would you say now in light of that, Simon, if there's somebody watching that's not engaged with the church, they're living a life and they feel sort of frustrated or angry or like they've got this hole and this void that they're desperately trying to fill and they don't know where to go and they don't know what to do. What would you advise them? What would you say to them? Um, I guess I, I'd use the words that the Lord uses actually, which is come and see. What's the worst that can happen? I have had such a truly blessed experience and such a completion of my life. Thanks be to God. Um, and go along and spend some time with your parish priest. Speak to your uh, deacon. Speak to the parishioners that you see coming and going. Come and see and you will be able to bathe in that radiance and that beauty. Simon, thank you so much for sharing that first half of your story. And we look forward um, to a few weeks time when we'll get to hear the rest of it and about how you were received into the church at Easter. Now, I don't want to give the game away, but I think lockdown has helped us all become more aware of how much we miss Jesus in the Eucharist. And I think when we hear Simon's story, we'll all be able to re relate to it in a very personal way. That's it for tonight's speakers. Um, it's time to reflect on what we have heard and to bring our own personal experience to the Lord. So we bring ourselves into the presence of God in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of the seasons. The season of Lent provides us with an opportunity to reflect on how much we need you in our lives. We thank you for the gift of the priesthood, in particular for Father Thomas, who was able to beautifully articulate the truth that we know in our hearts, that even when we desire to do good, we often fall. We thank you for Simon, and we give you praise that you have transformed his life and brought him into your loving arms. We pray for each other that our hearts may be softened to allow your message of love to penetrate more deeply and that we will grow in fellowship with you and with each other. St Augustine very wisely said that when you sing you pray twice. Um, there's just something so beautiful about music, the way that it lifts our heart and minds to God. So I'm going to play you a short piece of music by Hillsong Worship, it's called Broken Vessels. And it helps us to reflect on our own fallen nature and how God's amazing grace can make all the difference. Holy 
We come to you, Father, as your precious children, knowing that you love us unconditionally. We are sorry that we do not always live according to your will, choosing our own paths instead, just as Adam and Eve did in the garden. We thank you for the ability you have given us to achieve great things, and we pray that you will inspire us to rely on your strength, your wisdom, and your unending love to guide us on the right paths. Be with us as we seek to spread your good news and reach out in love to all those around us. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We come now to this week's reflection questions. I hope you've got quite a big journal. We've got a few for you this week. Here they are. How often do I sit and bathe in God's radiance and beauty? Take some time now to ponder God's goodness. Do I treat the health of my soul the same way I treat the health of my body? Where do I need God's help in my life? Where do I keep falling down? How do I see the church? As a field hospital where I can give and receive healing, or a fortress for the holy where I will be judged for my imperfections. Has anything Father Thomas said changed that? Can I personally do anything to change other people's perceptions? Now, if you didn't have the time to scribble those questions down, don't worry, uh, you can rewind the video, pause it, take a little photo, um, or you can download all the resources from our website, abdiocese.org.uk forward slash invited. So that's it for another week. I hope you enjoyed exploring the concept of sin in possibly a whole new way. It's not something that we should beat ourselves up about because we keep failing. It's an opportunity to reach out to the Lord and all his merciful goodness. I look forward to welcome you again next week when we're joined by David Beresford and Jane Ashton, who will talk to us all about exactly what it was that Jesus did for us when he died on the cross. I look forward to seeing you then. God bless. What is the kingdom of heaven like? What is life to the full? The road laid out before us, it's winding, but we trust in the journey that's open to all. So come to the Father, come one and all. You are invited to take up the call. His mercy can cover what's gone before, so come as you are. 
become one and all We won't ever walk alone Love is a person we can know A God who shows us his face Invites us by grace In friendship with Him we can grow So come to the Father Come one and all You are invited To take up the call His mercy can cover What's gone before So come as you are Come one and all So come as you are So come to the Father Come one and all You are invited To take up the call His mercy can cover What's gone before So come as you are Come one and all Come on and on